Hello everyone, welcome back to week six of COVID-19, Health Systems and Pandemics. Once again, my name is Dr. Clem, and I'm an adjunct assistant professor of data science at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. In the last week of the course, I reviewed mitigation via quarantine and other strategies. Though we incorporated the US response strategy, we took more of a global perspective on mitigation. This week, however, we will focus on the US. I'll therefore specifically address the role of the CDC, state, local, and tribal authorities in pandemic response and mitigation. If you have any questions about this week's material, please email me. My email address is listed above. Let's get started. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to distinguish between the role of federal, state, local, and tribal authorities in pandemic preparation and response. Describe the legal authority for public health agencies to isolate and quarantine during a pandemic, and then give examples of key laws that together create the legal framework for isolation and quarantine authority in the United States. Let's start by taking a look at the history of quarantine in the United States. Before we get to American shores, however, let's set the stage for the global spread of quarantine as an infectious disease mitigation strategy. Last week, we spoke about the origin of quarantine in Venice. In 1377, the port city of Ragusa, modern-day Dubrovnik, Croatia, which at the time was controlled by Venice, was the first to implement practical measures along these lines. Ships were isolated for 30 days under the policy of Trentino, which was then later extended to 40 days under the law of Quarantino for land travelers. The latter, of course, gave us the English word quarantine. During the next 100 years, similar laws were introduced in Italian and French ports. We also spoke about the role last week of sanitary cordons, military troops who enforced isolation and quarantine in sometimes harsh ways. Houses of plague victims in Europe, for instance, were often marked with a red cross, sealed and owners prevented by an armed guard from entering the premises. In the Ottoman Empire, individuals who escaped quarantine were often put to death by a firing squad. Quarantine, therefore, evoked a variety of emotions, such as fear and resentment. An institution was therefore needed to provide the necessary isolation structures, so for instance the facilities and implementation of the laws themselves, so hence the development of public health divisions at the municipal level. By the 16th century, quarantine infrastructure was expanded through the introduction of bills of health, a type of certification that the last port visited by tra travelers was in fact free from disease. A clean bill entitled the ship to use the port without quarantine. By the way, of course, this is the origin of the term a clean bill of health. However, Gensini et al. in 2004 described by the 18th century that the practice of quarantine and isolation was inconsistent between countries and subject to corruption. So, for instance, under the guise of disinfection, the seal on correspondence was often broken. Thus, Snowden argues that plague regulations had a strong impact on the formation of the modern state and the extension of political powers, even on global relations as international conventions and standardized regulations on quarantine had to be negotiated along with trade agreements, and in fact they weren't ratified until 1893. The plague and later diseases like cholera and yellow fever, as we will discuss, provided increased justification for not only state-level management of social spheres such as the economy and migration, but also for the unwarranted incursion of civil liberties and often the differential treatment and stigmatization stigmatization of marginalized groups. I'll thus briefly address a couple examples during the talk. When the United States was first established, little was done to prevent infectious diseases, with any action left to local and state jurisdiction. There were outbreaks of plague, smallpox, cholera, and new yellow fever in the New World. The U.S. faced a particularly devastating epidemic of yellow fever in the late 1700s and 1800s. Yellow fever was particularly an issue in New Orleans, with 22 epidemics killing over 150,000 people in the city over a 60-year period between the Louisiana Purchase and the Civil War. The second image from the top is a yellow fever immunity card that individuals were required to carry in cities like New Orleans in order to get a job or even get married. According to historian Catherine Olivares at Stanford, immunological discrimination became just one more form of bias in a region already premised on racial, ethnic, gender, and financial inequality. 
Pro-slavery theorists use yellow fever to argue that racial slavery was natural, even humanitarian, because it allowed wealthy white New Orleans to socially distance themselves so that they could stay at home in relative safety if black people were forced to labor and trade on their behalf. The first quarantine station and hospital in America was built at the Port of Philadelphia after a yellow fever outbreak in 1793. A single case of yellow fever could put the passengers and crew under quarantine for as long as six months. At the time, hospitals were largely devoted to the care of merchant sailors, which led to the formation of the Marine Hospital Service. In 1878, the National Quarantine Act vested quarantine authority to the Marine Hospital Service. This was the start of the shift of quarantine powers from states to the federal government. It also established a national board of health. The Marine Hospital Service was assigned the responsibility for the medical inspection of arriving immigrants at sites such as Ellis Island. The image at the top is of the Tinicum Lazaretto, which sits on the west bank of the Delaware River in Essington, Pennsylvania. It's considered to be the oldest and last surviving quarantine station in the United States, and by some accounts, the Western Hemisphere. It's still occupied, though now is an official building. The Lazaretto was commissioned by the Pennsylvania Board of Health in 1799, largely in response to the yellow fever epidemics that plagued Philadelphia in the late 18th century. Throughout most of the 19th century, the Lazaretto was the first stop for immigrants and merchants on incoming ships where passengers and cargo had to be quarantined until passing a health inspection. The bottom image is of a leprosarium on the Hawaiian island of Molokai, established in 1866. Now known as Hansen's disease, leprosy at the time condemned people to a life of isolation, far from others. Thousands lived and died there, as they were not allowed to leave until the 1960s. Despite having been cured, some chose not to leave, having arrived there as children. In 1889, Congress established the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps to lead and carry out the quarantine and isolation efforts. Because of the broadening responsibilities of the Marine Hospital Service, its name was changed in 1902 to the Public Health and Marine Hospital Service. As the emphasis of its responsibilities shifted from sailors to general public health and with the decommissioning of various old marine hospitals, the name was changed again in 1912 to just the Public Health Service. In 1893, Congress passed legislation that further clarified the federal role in quarantine activities due to cholera arriving on ships from Europe. Recall, as I mentioned earlier, this is when international agreements on quarantine were ratified. Local quarantine stations were gradually turned over to the federal government. The U.S. quarantine system was fully nationalized by 1921 when administration of the last quarantine station was transferred to the federal government. The image on the top is of a yellow fever camp established by the U.S. Marine Hospital Service on the border between Georgia and Florida during the yellow fever epidemic of 1888. Travelers from yellow fever-ridden areas were required to remain in the camp for the incubation period, which is about 6 to 10 days, before proceeding elsewhere. The bottom is of Public Health Service Commission Corps members in early uniforms. It wasn't until 1944, however, that the Public Health Service Act formed the federal government's quarantine authority. This act gave the U.S. Public Health Service responsibility for preventing the introduction, transmission, and spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the United States. The Public Health Service Act of 1944 is shown in the image. It also broadened the scope of the Commission Corps, allowing the commissioning of nurses, scientists, dietitians, physical therapists, sanitarians, and veterinarians to be part of the effort to reduce the spread of disease. In 1946, the CDC, which was then known as the National Communicable Disease Center, was formed with a primary mission to prevent malaria from spreading across the U.S. Check out the link to the CDC timeline to track its modest beginning to becoming the nation's premier health promotion, prevention, and preparedness agency. In 1967, the CDC took over federal quarantine functions. If we move forward to the 1970s, however, the CDC reduced the number of quarantine stations from 55 down to 8. Why do you think that happened? Recall, last week we discussed that the prevalent thinking at the time was that due to measures such as vaccines and antibiotics, infectious diseases were thought to be a phenomenon of the past. By 1995, all U.S. ports of entry were covered by only seven quarantine stations. In 2004 to 2007, the number of quarantine stations were increased to 20, 
So do you recall from last week what was happening around that time regarding pandemic preparedness in the U.S.? Last week, we discussed that in 2005, President George Bush, already concerned with bioterrorism after the September 11 attacks, read The Great Influenza, a book about the flu outbreak of 1918. This partially contributed to the U.S. unrolling preparedness plans that emphasized the role of NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions, later called community mitigation strategies. This included social distancing. Let's briefly revisit how social distancing became a bedrock of modern preparedness response. In 2005, 14-year-old Laura Glass did a class project involving a model of social networks at her Albuquerque High School. Laura's father, Robert Glass, was a scientist who specialized in building models to explain how complex systems work and how they can fail. Robert extended Laura's work to do epidemic modeling. According to their calculations, in a town of 10,000 people, if the school stayed open, half the population would be infected. But if they closed the schools, only 500 individuals would get sick. And yes, by the way, Laura was a co-author in the eventual publications. We also reviewed research last week that evaluated the impact of closures during the 1918 pandemic. This combined insight led to public health experts at the time recommending that school closures would be a mit good mitigation strategy. Yet, there was considerable amount of skepticism regarding the suggestion from public health officials and policymakers in the 2000s. This was due to their confidence in pharmaceutical measures and the ethical and legal aspects of placing limitations on public gatherings and limitations made them cautious. However, as part of its role in national preparedness and response coordination, the CDC surveyed community leaders around the U.S. and decided to embed shutdowns and social distancing in their preparedness guides and pandemic simulations. This strategy was used in a limited capacity during the 2009 H1N1 flu outbreak, so the coronavirus pandemic is the first time these particular communi community mitigation strategies, school closures for instance, have been used on a national scale. By the way, these photos are from the 1918 Liberty Loan Parade in Philadelphia, which went on b despite the Director of Public Health being warned about possible health ramifications of large gatherings. According to the Smithsonian, within 72 hours after the September 28th parade, around 200,000 people had attended. Every bed in Philadelphia's 31 hospitals was filled. By the week ending October 5th, some 2,600 people in Philadelphia had died from the flu or its complications. A week later, that number rose to more than 4,500. Okay, so now that we've briefly reviewed some key events in U.S. quarantine history, let's turn our attention to contemporary legal authorities for isolation and quarantine in the U.S. Let's start by distinguishing between these two terms according to the CDC. Firstly, quarantine is defined as the compulsory separation, including the restriction of movement, of people who've potentially been exposed to a contagious disease until it can be determined whether they have become sick or no longer pose a risk to others. This determination could be made, for example, based on the time elapsed from their potential exposure. Isolation, however, is defined as the separation of people known or suspected to be infected by signs, symptoms, or laboratory criteria with a contagious disease from those who are not sick to prevent them from transmitting the disease to others. The figure shows the CDC posted distinguishing between the two for COVID-19. It's also important that we distinguish that quarantine is not the same as a statewide stay-at-home order. Stay-at-home orders apply broadly to the entire population of a state or locality and affect more than just those who are confirmed to have an infectious disease or those who have come into contact with someone carrying the disease. Under a stay-at-home order, individuals are encouraged to stay at home and leave their place of residence only out of necessity, for instance, to shop for groceries or receive medical care. The federal government derives its authority for isolation and quarantine from the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Under Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services is authorized to take measures to prevent the entry and spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the United States and between states. The CDC's authority to exercise quarantine and isolation powers for specific diseases derives from the Federal Public Health Service Act and a series of presidential executive orders. Executive orders can range from halting business operations to restricting freedom of movement, to limiting civil rights and liberties, and even to commandeering property. 
So for instance, on January 31st this year, President Donald Trump issued a proclamation in response to the COVID-19 outbreaks suspending certain entry into the United States, specifically outlining medical screening and quarantine where appropriate. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, is the U.S. government's principal agency for protecting the health of all Americans and providing essential human services. HHS administers more grant dollars than all other federal agencies combined. In the partial HHS organizational chart on the right, note that the operating divisions of HHS include the National Institutes of Health, NIH, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, which are all highlighted in the orange box. While federal isolation and quarantine are authorized by executive order of the President, the authority for carrying out the functions related to quarantine and isolation on a daily basis has been delegated to the CDC. Under its delegated authority, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the CDC works to fulfill this responsibility through a variety of activities including the operation of quarantine station at points of entry. We'll talk about these shortly. The establishment of standards for medical examination of individuals who are coming into the United States and the administration of interstate and foreign quarantine regulations which govern the international and interstate movement of persons, animals, and cargo. According to the CDC, federal isolation and quarantine are currently authorized for the communicable diseases listed here. You will recognize some of these from our review of pandemics last week, as well as at the start of this particular talk. Viral hemorrhagic fevers include Marburg virus and Ebola virus. Note that the list includes influenza and severe acute respiratory syndromes, which includes the coronavirus. The president can revise this list according to executive order. So if you'd like to take a look at the specific laws and regulations governing the control of communicable diseases, check out the link at the bottom. Under Title 42, the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1771, which was last updated in 2012, the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine has the legal authority to detain, medically examine, and release persons arriving into the United States and traveling between states who are suspected of carrying the communicable diseases listed on the previous slide. Therefore, as part of its federal authority, the CDC routinely monitors persons arriving at U.S. land border crossings and passengers and crew arriving at ports of entry for signs and symptoms of communicable diseases. The CDC has the legal authority to detain any person who may have an infectious disease that is specified by executive order to be quarantinable. If necessary, the CDC can deny ill persons with these diseases entry into the United States. The CDC can also have them admitted into a hospital or confined to a home for a certain amount of time to prevent the spread of disease. When alerted about an ill passenger or crew member by the pilot or plane or captain of a ship, the CDC may detain passengers and crew as necessary to investigate whether the cause of the illness on board is a communicable disease. As discussed earlier, there are U.S. quarantine stations located at 20 ports of entry and land border crossings across the U.S. These are shown as yellow dots on the map on the top. Ports of entry include airports and seaports, whereas land border crossings include road and rail crossings known as border stations. An official port of entry has a dedicated customs presence. Medical and public health offices managed by the CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine decide whether ill persons can enter the United States and what measures can be taken to prevent the spread of contagious diseases. Their roles include responding to any illness on vessels at these quarantine stations and administration of therapeutics as necessary. There are other illnesses of public health significance, such as measles, mumps, and rubella, which are not on the list of quarantinable illnesses from a couple slides ago. However, they still pose a public health risk, so public health workers still respond to these reports of ill travelers aboard airplane ships and la at land border crossings. Officers also collect and monitor health information for new immigrants and asylum seekers and inspect entering materials that may pose a threat to human health, such as human remains being repatriated to the U.S. for burial and wildlife. The CDC also works with a variety of partners, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, local and state and public health departments, more about this shortly, state public health laboratories, state and territorial epidemiologists, and bi-national public health partners, like the public health agencies of Canada and Mexico, as shown on the map at the bottom.
as an example of the multifaceted roles that the CDC plays in pandemic response and management. Take a look at this recent infographic. It summarizes how the CDC has facilitated the response to COVID-19, including their role in travel, diagnostics, preparing epidemic guidance for healthcare systems, schools, businesses, and communities. So for instance, you can take a look at their website to find the specific recommendations regarding who should quarantine. This would be a person who has been in close contact with someone who tested positive. Further, they give examples of what would qualify as close contact. So for instance, you were within six feet of someone who has COVID-19 for a total of 15 minutes or more. However, people who tested positive for COVID-19 in the three months prior to exposure do not need to quarantine. On their website, the CDC also provides different scenarios of when to start and end quarantine. For instance, they have different recommendations if you live with someone who has COVID-19 and can avoid close contact versus if you can't avoid close contact. They also provide guidelines for caregivers, as well as current insight on issues such as reinfection and pets testing positive. If a quarantinable disease is suspected or identified, the CDC may issue a federal isolation or quarantine order. In the rare event that a federal order is issued by the CDC itself, those individuals will be provided with an order for quarantine or isolation. This is an example of a CDC quarantine order for SARS-CoV-2. The letter first outlines why the individual is being placed under quarantine in Section B. In Section C, the location of quarantine is specified. In Section D, the terms of the quarantine, so for instance, travel restrictions. And in Section E, legal rights regarding key issues like penalties for violating the order. Also note that at the end, federal, state, and local, local law enforcement officials are required to aid in federal quarantine enforcement and that violation cons constitutes a criminal misdemeanor punishable by a fine and or imprisonment. This summary was just published by the CDC in late September. It details how the CDC received funding via three congressional acts, the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act, and the Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act. It showed how the CDC allocated the funding to assist the coronavirus response. We see that over $750 million went to states, localities, and territories, while over $208 million went to tribal nations, consortia, and organizations. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, also provided both the authority and funding for the establishment of the Ready Reserve Corps. The United States Public Health Service Commission Corps will accept Ready Reserve Corps applications online beginning in fall 2020 and will commission its first officers in spring 2021. I also included a link for you to check them out if you're interested. The National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, known as NEDS, is a program that includes the surveillance system for collection, analysis, and sharing of health data, as well as policies, laws, electronic information systems, processes, and resources at the local, state, territorial, and national levels. It's used by about 3,000 public health departments across the U.S. to monitor, control, and prevent about 120 diseases. Notifiable disease surveillance begins at the level of the local, state, and territorial public health departments, also known as jurisdictions. Jurisdictional laws and regulations mandate reporting of cases of specified infectious and non-infectious conditions to health departments. Health departments participating in NEDS voluntarily submit case notification data to DHIS, the CDC Division of Health Informatics and Surveillance, and also submit some data directly to CDC programs. Health departments gather and use data on these diseases to protect their local communities. DHIS supports NEDS by receiving, securing, processing, and providing nationally viable infectious diseases data to disease-specific CDC programs. C DHIS and CDC programs then publish this statistical data based on NEDS. DHIS also supports local, state, and territorial public health departments in helping them to collect, manage, and submit case notification data to the CDC. For instance, in the case of COVID-19, NEDS and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists work together to ensure that state, local, and territorial public health departments are classifying cases of COVID-19 consistently. So now that we've discussed the federal role in pandemic response and preparation, what's the role of state, local, and tribal authorities? A key point of this lecture is that, per the CDC, 
except at the nation's land borders and ports of entry, the federal government is not in charge. State, local, and tribal authorities are the ones who enforce isolation and quarantine within their borders. The federal government may assist state, local, and tribal authorities in preventing the spread of communicable diseases in their jurisdiction, and state, local, and tribal authorities may offer their assistance in the enforcement of federal quarantine. According to the American Bar Association, under the U.S. Constitution's Tenth Amendment and the U.S. Supreme Court decisions over the nearly 200 years, state governments have the primary authority to control the spread of dangerous diseases within their jurisdictions. The Tenth Amendment, which gives states all powers not specifically given to the federal government, allows them the authority to take public health emergency actions, such as setting quarantines and business restrictions. In the U.S., therefore, our defense against epidemics is divided amongst 2,684 state, local, and tribal public health departments. Each of these groups is responsible for setting the rules, monitoring people within their own jurisdiction, imposing isolation or quarantine as needed, and tracing the contacts of those who fall ill. So federal quarantine orders are implemented and enforced by state and local health authorities within their jurisdictions, not by federal officials. In the event of a conflict, however, federal law is supreme. We'll return to this later. States also have police power functions to protect the health, safety, and welfare of persons within their borders. To control the spread of disease within their borders, states also have laws to enforce the use of isolation and quarantine. The National Conference of State Legislatures, the NCSL, is an association of nonpartisan public officials composed of sitting state legislatures from the states, territories, and commonwealths of the United States. Their mission is to advance the effectiveness, independence, and integrity of legislatures and to foster interstate cooperation and facilitate the exchange of information amongst legislatures such as public health management. You can visit their site where you can find a table that summarizes state law authority for quarantine and isolation within state borders, including the authority to initiate quarantine and isolation, limitations on state quarantine powers, and penalties for violations. So in other words, as we described on the previous slide, every state has its own laws and regulations. You can conduct a full text search or type the state name in the box on their site to find the laws for your state. While this chart provides a good synopsis of quarantine laws, just keep in mind, it's not comprehensive legal guidance. You can click the blue links on the table that will take you to the last amendment of each statute. It also notes that during this pandemic, there was a difference in both the language and requirements related to the different orders, such as stay-at-home orders. As an example, let's take a look at Pennsylvania's regulations. This is the full text for disease control measures. So we see here that the wording highlighted in orange reflects what we just discussed on the previous slide, that the state or local health authority directs the surveillance, isolation, quarantine, and appropriate control measures for communicable diseases. Note that this particular code also applies to animals. This part of the Pennsylvania code refers to timing at the start of isolation which is recommended promptly following the case report, and where the individual should remain isolated and the provision of instructions and measures that need to be taken to reduce the spread of disease. The last portion of the Pennsylvania Code refers specifically to quarantine, which specifies the quarantine of contacts and similar to isolation, where they should be quarantined and the provision of necessary instructions. Also note that the code authorizes medical observation of contacts as frequently as necessary during this period of observation. So what about the penalties associated with public health laws? Again, so you'll find variants in this across the states. So if you take a look at just the summary of the New York health laws, there's a separate statute for penalties which provides the grounds for an investigation, a subsequent court appearance if determined to be necessary by the health officer, and institutionalization if the judge deems the individual to be a source of danger to others. However, if you take a look at just the summaries of the Maryland and Montana codes, the penalties are more specific. Again, we see a difference with between $10 and $100 for quarantine non-compliance in Montana, whereas versus a fine up to 3000 in Maryland. In Maryland, this may also include being charged with a misdemeanor and imprisonment of up to a year. So as we discussed previously, tribal authorities are the ones who enforce isolation and quarantine on tribal lands. 
There are 566 federally recognized Indian tribes in Alaska native villages, distributed across the majority, so 35, of the 50 states. The U.S. recognizes tribes as sovereign nations subject to certain federal laws. As described by the U.S. Supreme Court, tribal sovereignty refers to the authority of tribes to make their own laws and be ruled by them. The federal government has a unique legal and political government-to-government relationship with tribal governments and a special obligation to provide services for American Indians and Alaska Natives based on these individuals' relationship to tribal governments. This is done via the Indian Health Service. The Indian Health Service is an operating division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In the orange box on the right, IHS is responsible for providing direct medical and public health services to members of federally recognized Native American tribes and Alaska Native people. Executive Order 13175, Consultation and Coordination with Indian Tribal Governments, requires consulta consultation with Indian Tribal Governments when considering policies that affect tribal communities. The Department's Tribal Consultation Policy, first developed with tribal participation in 2004, was updated in 2010. HHS works with tribal governments, Indian organizations, or other tribal organizations to facilitate greater consultation and coordination between states and tribes on health and human service issues. Tribes also have police power authority to take actions that promote the health, safety, and welfare of their own tribal members. Tribal health authorities may enforce their own isolation and quarantine laws within tribal lands, if such laws exist. Barnard 2015 notes that a shifting and complex body of law controls jurisdiction on Indian lands. This jurisdictional, jurisdictional uncertainty is compounded in some states by a rocky history of state-tribal relations and by geography, as tribal lands may be fragmented and checkerboarded with non-Indian lands within a state, or they may even straddle the border between two or more states. The public health infrastructure amongst tribes also seems to vary greatly. Some have their own health departments and health codes, while others lack these. Public health emergencies may also pose a greater threat to tribes than to non-tribal groups due to factors such as the prevalence of chronic disease, poverty, and difficulties accessing care. In both the 1918 and 1919 influenza pandemic and the 2009 H1N1 influenza event, the mortality rate amongst Indians in the United States was roughly four times that of other groups. There are 12 tribal epidemiology centers across the U.S. that are shown on the bottom map that serve American Indian, Alaska Native tribal and urban communities by managing public health information systems, investigating diseases of concern, managing disease prevention and control programs, responding to public health emergencies, and coordinating these activities with other public health authorities. Several state and local governments have formed agreements with tribe, so for instance that facilitate transfer strategic national stockpile medical assets and the sharing of public health data. The top map shows the population of individuals in each state who self-identify as American Indian and Alaska Native in each state. The bottom map shows the tribal epidemiology center regions across the U.S. At the bottom is a link to an article that addresses contact tracing efforts by Indian Health Services during the pandemic. So now that we've discussed the role of the CDC, state, local, and tribal authorities, who's in charge in a public health emergency? In her book, Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics, Bioterror Attacks, and Other Public Health Crises, Dr. Laura Kahn addresses this very question. She notes that leadership in the U.S. is decentralized and that crises are primarily state and local government responsibilities. She interviewed numerous public health leaders and asked them who would be in charge during a public health crisis. Kahn quotes Dr. Ruth Berkelman, former Assistant Surgeon General and Deputy Director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases and Director of the Center for Public Health Preparedness at Emory University. At the state level, the governor is in charge, and the state epidemiologist usually calls the shots. States and Indian Health can invite the CDC for assistance if they need it. However, if a crisis crosses state lines, then it's likely there may be more federal involvement. Khan also quotes Mark Gillarducci, currently the director of California's Office for Emergency Services. At the national level, the buck stops at the White House. The federal government is not set up to be a first responder. They're designed to support state government, which in turn supports late local government. They provide additional resources that are critical to states. In a pandemic, you may need to shut down transportation, borders, and airports, so the federal government can take the lead here. They would activate the National Response Framework, 
elected officials, so governors, mayors, county supervisors, for instance, need to provide policy oversight and leadership. It's critical that they all follow designated policies, procedures, and coordination systems. Kahn also notes that in the U.S., the personality of the elected official often determines the leadership approach used during a public health crisis. This determines whether or not they delegate decision-making to their professional appointees or whether they make their own decisions based on advice from political experts. Kahn also suggested that federalizing public health, so making public health a federal responsibility, would reduce the disparity between the varying capabilities of states and local authorities to respond to public health crisis. So let's talk about this next. Fundamental questions of constitutional law have emerged during this pandemic. In an opinion piece in June, Michelle Goodwin, professor of law and founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy at the UC Irvine School of Law, acknowledged the ongoing national debate related to the interaction between constitutional rights, state police powers, and federalism surrounding questions like, what are the limits of government action in the midst of a pandemic? Do governors have the authority to issue executive orders to shelter in place or quarantine? Can the legislature prioritize some business activity as essential while not granting that status to others? Is it legal to impose shelter in place on Sundays, a day when many Americans seek to worship? She argues that during a pandemic, some constitutional rights may be burdened, but only to protect the public health and promote safety. She attests that governmental authority to impose statewide shutdowns is a clear and consistent approach with constitutional law and is legal, and that for almost 300 years the quarantine has been justified and legally upheld. Large-scale isolation and quarantine was last enforced during the influenza pandemic in 1918. As we discussed last week, only a few public health events have prompted federal isolation and quarantine orders since then. However, Goodwin cautions that though quarantine and isolation may be legal, historically public health has been used to perpetuate social and racial stereotypes and discrimination. She highlights that protecting the public's health and safety during COVID-19 requires prioritizing the public health while safeguarding civil liberties. We've referred to federalism a couple times now, so let's talk about it briefly. According to Cornell's Legal Information Institute, federalism is a system of government in which the same territory is controlled by two different levels of government. So generally, an overarching national government is responsible for broader governance of larger territorial areas, while the smaller subdivisions, states, and cities govern the issues of local concern. Federalism is therefore the division of power between a national government and states. Both the national government and the smaller political subdivisions have the power to make laws, and both have a certain level of autonomy from each other. In the United States, the Constitution has established a system of dual sovereignty under which the states have surrendered many of their powers to the federal government, but also retain some sovereignty. However, Article 6 of the Constitution contains a supremacy clause, which fundamentally says that when the laws of the federal government are in conflict with the laws of a state's government, the federal law will supersede the state law. Recall, we discussed this earlier in this talk. In week 7 of this course, you look specifically at which methodologies are or have been effective for preventing the spread of COVID-19. In the interim, take a minute to explore this interactive timeline from Johns Hopkins to see the major infection control measures and reopenings per state since March, alongside the number of deaths and new cases. Select the state of interest and then get started. Note that the red dots in indicate closings and green dots indicate openings. Other policy changes and events are shown in gray. If you click a dot and then click next to it, you can scroll through key events in chronological order. I also listed a link from the National Conference on State Legislatures, NCSL, with state data and policy actions to address COVID-19. It lists the bills related to and responding to COVID-19 that have been introduced in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. The data is also presented in visualization form, as well as a link at the bottom to state's fiscal response. Additionally, if you're wondering which states had the best pandemic response thus far, you can also check out this recent article in Politico. The authors address the three categories that re represent the greatest challenges states are facing in pandemic response, fighting the virus, managing the economic fallout, and reopening schools. In particular, they addressed which state is addressing racial disparities in care most effectively, and where disaster prep paid off. Hint, think, which state has experienced a lot of hurricanes?
Read the article for more on their assessment. As you will appreciate from that interactive, there have been varied state-level responses to the pandemic. The unique brand of U.S. public health federalism has its advantages, including the flexibility to customize responses to the unique characteristics of a local population, to maintain state budgets, and to test new policies. However, federalism can prevent obstacles to implementing a national pandemic preparedness and response strategy, especially one that is timely, efficient, and unified. Recall that the federal government focuses on measures necessary to prevent the interstate or international spread of disease. So the CDC's modern-day interstate authority is limited primarily to do not board orders to prevent air travel within the U.S. by persons known to be ill and relies on state health departments to request that order. So state and local health officials are the final authority on what preventative measures to take within their jurisdiction. So states can choose to ignore federal quarantine guidelines and decide that on more drastic measures are required. In the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year, Hafiji et al. pointed out that primary concern of this legal framework has long been that it affords officials too much discretion with too few checks and poor decisions. They point out that typically the concern is that officials will implement unduly coercive measures in response to public demands to act. So, for instance, during the 2014 Ebola outbreak, New Jersey's governor ordered a nurse returning from Sierra Leone into quarantine, although her case didn't merit it under CDC guidelines. Similarly, Gordon et al. noted in the Journal of American Medical As Association earlier that year that the U.S. public health federalism assures that the coronavirus response depends on zip code. Lax stay-at-home orders in one area may foil much stricter measures in a neighboring region and intensifies and reveals long-standing inequitable distribution of power and resources. There's also the influence of politics on state and local level response. Public health departments work for the various levels of government and often get caught up in politics, even when they do their best to remain objective. Both politics and the spread of misinformation are critical factors to consider when planning programs for the remainder of this pandemic and future pandemics. Gordon Adol made the following recommendations on how we can retain our federalist flexibility by developing a set of robust federal guidelines for pandemic response to reduce the level of variation in the state and local level response that we've seen during this pandemic. So for instance, their recommendation was that federal standards for local stay-at-home orders could be derived from data-driven thresholds for case numbers, transmission rates, and the status of bordering states. Also, they suggested the distribution of medical supplies and equipment should be systemized with clear, data-driven allocation guidelines. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, could then act based on these needs. Also, they suggested that epidemic data collection should be standardized, including tracking by race or ethnicity and household income, to identify and target resources to areas exhibiting health disparities in systems such as NEDS. The advantage of these suggestions is that most don't most will not require congressional action, but in fact depend on data. Recall, last week we discussed the importance of data in pandemic mitigation. Further, Hajafi et al. noted that Congress could use its spending power to further encourage states to follow a uniform playbook for community mitigation, and that if needed could create incentives for action or even threaten to withhold federal funding without compliance. Gordon points out that these data-driven recommendations will require more coordination and cooperation, but doing so could result in providing a uniform baseline level of access to health care that will improve equity not only during the pandemic, but for generations to come. Successful responses to public health emergencies must heed the valuable lessons of the past. Thus, after adding some more historical context, this week we focused on distinguishing between the role of federal, state, local, and tribal authorities in pandemic preparation and response. Except at the nation's land borders and ports of entry, where the federal government is in charge, state, local, and tribal authorities are the ones who enforce isolation and quarantine within their jurisdictions. Despite pharmaceutical and technological advances, quarantine and isolation remain central to public health preparedness and for controlling infectious disease. We reviewed key aspects of legal authority for public health agencies to isolate and quarantine during a pandemic. I have provided several resources for you to continue learning about our ongoing response. We also reviewed recent recommendations on how we can retain our federalist flexibility 
but still improve the current and future pandemic response approach. Public health measures such as quarantine and isolation remain controversial, as such strategies raise political, ethical, and socioeconomic issues, and warrant a careful balance between public interest and individual rights. As Tognati noted, these measures require vigilant attention to avoid causing prejudice and intolerance. As we discussed last week, public trust and buy-in should be gained throughout regular, transparent, and comprehensive communications that balance the risks and benefits of public health interventions. Here are the references used in this talk. As before, I listed the links to the articles if you're interested in reading more about any of these topics. In addition to Snowden's book on epidemics and society, I recommend that you take a look at Laura Kahn's book, Who's in Charge? If you're interested in leadership during public health crises, this is the end of the week six lecture. <laughs>